Joining me now is Ian Roger. He is the CEO of Jindalee Lithium. Thanks for coming in. Good to meet you. Thanks for having me. So let's start with a snapshot, an overview of the uh, the McDermott uh, project in Oregon on the Nevada border. This is one of the largest lithium resources in the United States. The company hit a major milestone with a pre-feasibility study. So give us a snapshot if you could. Yep. So yeah, G Jindalee is a, a U.S. focused lithium company. Um, you mentioned the McDermott project. That's our core flagship uh, project. We pegged it in 2018 um, and sort of had exploration success straight away. And so over a couple of years, we built that um, resource out into one of the largest in, in North America. It's a sedimentary lithium deposit. So um, it's in the same caldera as uh, uh, Lithium America's Thacker Pass project. And it's similar in, in size and scale to, to their deposit. We recently, as you mentioned, completed our pre-feasibility study with um, Fluor Corporation as a, as a lead engineer. And uh, we can talk through the metrics, but it's, it's you know what, um, large scale, long life, low cost source of American made uh, lithium chemicals. So we think it's a really strategic asset. Right, uh, long life, low cost. Can you give us some of the highlights from the PFS? Yep, um, so it's the, the PFS uh, we had a sort of 63 year uh, project life, but that really only uses 15% of the resource mm -hmm. base. So it just shows some of the embedded optionality in there. The cost, the costs, um, uh, it's the bottom of the, bottom of the, the cost curve, the production rate, for the first 10 years is 47,500 kilotons of, of lithium carbonate a year, but really that could be um, scaled or, or, or phased um, in, in future phases, but um, you know, that really is chunky um, lithium production. Um, it's a, in a lot of ways, the parameters look like a copper porphyry deposit in that there's a large capital investment, but it's got like annuity, high margin cash flows over a long, long period of time. And so based on the analysis in the PFS, it's sort of 60 plus percent EBITDA margins, um, big capital project though, multi-billion dollar capital investment required. And so our focus now is, is finding the right partners to take the um, project forward into the feasibility stage. Right, and so the, the, the PFS, as, as you said, only accounts for about 15% of the total resource if you include the inferred. I know it's early days, you're not yes. there yet, but w what do you think the long-term uh, uh, optionality is in terms of having a much bigger resource? Um, the resource expansion is, is not a, a core focus of ours. It's open in a number of different directions, but um, it's really, you know, it's really big enough. And so our, our exploration efforts is, is focused around, or will be focused around infield, infield drilling, lifting the level of confidence, providing the sample needed to do more um, pilot plant test work for, you know, more detailed engineering um, down the track. We could easily expand the resource. We've got an elevated cutoff grade at the moment. Um, with you, America's recently updated their resource with a you know slightly lower, lower cutoff, ex expanding um, their resource. But I think really we've got what we've got now has immense optionality just embedded in it. In that we, we could um, you know um, there's a lot of parallels in with you America's um, story. They recently put out a, a phased you know expansion um, uh, plan that sort of you know almost um, quadruples or more their current um, pr production and. We see optionality like that um, in our deposit just on our current resource base, so it's about better understanding what we've got as opposed to expanding the pie. So Ian, one of the things you've said about the PFS is that it, it, it's allowed the company to meaningfully re-engage with potential strategic partners with the U.S. government in, in, terms, of, uh, in uh, terms of funding. So can you elaborate on some of that? Yeah, for sure. You know, we've had you know, a fair bit of inbound interest, particularly you know, after the after the discovery, and then when it was for a brief period of time, the largest uh, lithium uh, resource in the in the U.S. and a lot of those groups that were interested wanted to see some parameters around what the cost might look like. And now we've got the PFS. You know, um, we've done test work from from all um, uh, all the way through to final battery grade lithium carbonate, and we've got a good understanding where the costs are. We think there's lots of opportunity to improve on those, but now we've got some real parameters to talk to talk to um, partners around, um, and that's also fed into some of our government funding conversations. So yeah, our real strategy to take the project forward is, uh, on one hand, um, government funding, we've got a DOD grant application um, that could co-fund the next stage of work, including a feasibility study, drill program, and, and test work program. So that could co-fund up to 50% um, if we're successful. The other bit is try, um, bringing in a partner um, to help um, fund um, the feasibility study, but it's, it's more than that. This is a large capital project there's a lot of decisions, um, you know, we've made um, assumptions around scale, uh, product selection, et cetera, and there's opportunity to sort of shape that um, and make sure it fits into the um, US battery supply chain. So that's a, a real core focus going forward over the next um, six to 12 months, and we're pretty close to appointing some advisors to help us on that. 
Right. So you're you're, you're talking about it there, the 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 first part of the year before you uh, reevaluate funding. So can you just take us take us through the the timeline to get there? Yeah. So um, so if we zoom out a second, yeah, we're um, yeah this this year work program focused the first um, I guess six six months is around um, re-engaging um, with potential partners and um, progressing our government funding situation. Um, we're also working on uh, a key permitting milestone in the middle middle of the year. So they're the key the key um, bits that we're going to work on in the six months um, of this year. And then um, the decision around fit when we commence a feasibility study and some of those higher cost options will be dependent on you know the outcome of, of those earlier um, conversations. Luckily, we've you know the, the the story of Jindalee really is we've been around for 20 odd years. Um, we've had lots of um, success in spinning assets out, project generation and development. So we haven't raised had to raise too much capital in the past, um, and we've been able to self fund through our spin outs. And the reason why that's relevant is about a week ago we we sold a minority position in one of our spin outs that we spun out two years ago. Um, they had some very early stage expiration ground in Australia, and so now we've got in the order of four and a half million dollars Australian in the bank. We're well funded to do the current um, work program and so we're in a pretty enviable position in terms of the lithium market. We haven't had to tap the, the equity market and we've sort of funded through these next couple of catalysts. Right, that non-core sale was 2.75 million correct. and so and added to the to the kitty so to speak. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So with what we already had in the bank, yeah, yeah, exactly. Very good. Now as far as the, the stock, it, it had a good run going, it's consolidated since then. What do you think is the, uh, the market's impression of, of the story right now? Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's a good question. I think uh, our historically, uh, Jindalee has been, uh, the shareholder base has been Australian high net worth um, investors. There's been institutions that have been in and out of the stock with the market cycle, essentially. Um, and we've had a limited presence in, in North America. And if we have a look at our peer group, um, you know, there's a lot of groups that have um, traded on much higher multiples, have early stage projects and us and the, the common denominators. I think they've got um, you know, North American um, investors. So we're spending more time this year, um, given that we've done, completed some good quality technical work, is raising the, the profile of the project, particularly amongst the North American high net worth investors. And that'll continue to be a, you know, a, a focus going forward. And we think that's, you know, one of, been one of the, you know, the differentiators um, um, for us. And are you uh, are you finding a, a receptive audience? Investors are interested. They have good feedback. Yeah, I think um, you know we're starting to see some green shoots from investors that you know seeing the bottom of the market. You know they've seen, particularly you know those sort of groups that have got a multi-year view. You know you, you're having a look in the lithium market at the moment. You know the big groups are, are essentially calling the bottom of the market with like Rio making their Arcadium acquisition, even General Motors next door to us. You know, agreeing a lot in expanded joint venture with with the Americas with a circa nine hundred and fifty million dollar commitment. So, the strategics are, uh, are, are moving, um, and so I think some of these longer term investors are seeing the opportunity that these assets that have you know that have that big potential. This is the time to sort of get in for that that leveraged upside as the as the lithium market will tighten over the next you know twelve months. Okay, so you you think there's an inflection point right around now? Well, I think the timing's the million dollar question, right? Mm -hmm. um, We've seen, but if, if if we zoom out a second and look at you know the last four years, or like up to say the start of 2024, um, you know the, there was about 500,000 tons into the market. The average price was $30 a kilo. You know, going forward, based on pretty conservative demand numbers, there's going to be, be double that, and the price is $12 a kilo now in, in in China. So half the industry, you know, I'm from Australia. Half the m most of the lithium mines in Western Australia are losing money on a free cash flow basis at the moment. So. It's fundamentally unsustainable, and when we started seeing this uh, tail off in the lithium market, we had analysts saying it's going to be 2030 um, until we get a um, deficit. Then you know that's improved in 2028, and now we're seeing some of the you know, um, some analysts saying it could be 2026. No one really knows, but hmm. I think with if history is a guide, it'll catch everyone off by surprise. So w we think we are offer good value at these levels. All right, Ian, can you summarize your thoughts? And, and, and uh, I know you do a lot of these conferences and you're always giving the pitch. Give it, if you could give us the 30 to 45 second uh, uh, pitch before uh, Jinder Lee. Yeah, I think, you know, highly strategic asset. Um, and now I've got some real parameters behind it that demonstrate that, um, you know, we're incredibly, um, you know, are cheap. Even every, every lithium company thinks they're cheap at the moment. Hmm. But even compared to other lithium companies, we've got a market cap of about 15 million Aussie a at the moment, that's just incredibly cheap given the size of the asset and our, our peer group. So, um, combine that with you know, so a lot of catalysts in the in the pipeline and you know some some funding in the bank um, 
to do it. You know, we've got, you know, we're, I, I think we offer pretty compelling value um, for investors. All right, great stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the update and we'll see you soon. Ian Rogers, CEO of Jindalee Lithium.